All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really good to be back and talking to some Bentley students. Um, so I appreciate the invite, Mark, from Mark and Mark, lots of Marks um, in, the, in the room. But um, it's really good to be back. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe my background and some things pertaining to, yes, how retailers can use different touch points to capture insights, but also just kind of the world of customer insights as a whole, because I found, you know, in thinking about topics that it is kind of underrepresented in the sphere of technology. Um, we hear a lot of things about, you know, programming in certain realms in gen, gen AI. And I think one field within marketing, at least, that's really tech driven um, is consumer insights. And I found it super fascinating as I obviously became a brand researcher um, a couple of years ago, but I think that you all might find it really fascinating as well. And so having said that, uh, just to introduce myself. So my name is Mark Latif. Um, I graduated Bentley in 2016. I majored in computer information systems um, with a finance minor. What did I do when I studied uh, Bentley? Um, okay. Same thing that most people do. I studied abroad in Copenhagen in 2014. I was part of Greek life, uh, Delta Cap Epsilon. I was in the Bentley Investment Club. And, you know, lots of things felt like a while ago. I guess it was a while ago at this point. Um, but my entire career has been kind of centered around the intersection of corporate strategy and technology. And cognizant that that might sound like a whole lot of nothing, it basically means that, you know, during my time at EY, for example, um, I spent two years, two and a half years as a management consultant working on some pretty cool stuff. Um, I would say the first half of my career was focused on tech consulting. That was really nice because I got to use a lot of the technical insights that I gained from my academic career in a real world setting, helping businesses um, implement large scale tech solutions. And then in the latter half, I became a little bit less technical, if you will, and moved to supply chain consulting, which was also really fun. Um, <laughs> fun is a big word, but it was really interesting working in different fields, uh, manufacturing plants, for example, um, helping organizations optimize their costs, really entertaining um, from a consulting standpoint. And then I kind of kept that same energy and moved on to American Express, where I worked in corporate strategy. And so there was a internal group at American Express, which focused on corporate strategy. And you could think of that field as um, it was kind of a team where we had a lot of ex-consultants um, work on various projects for executives, where we have, for example, a new product launch and we want to go to market in a new country, or we want to launch a new credit card offering a certain sort of benefit. And so it was a lot, a lot of large scale projects that they kind of engage us on. And instead of hiring, for example, consultants at EY, they would use our team to strategize, build a plan and help the executives manage against that plan. And so I had worked at two really big companies and I said, okay, I'm going to try a bit of a smaller company. And I moved on to another company called CoverWallet, which was subsequently bought by Aon. So I ended up at another big company um, and I was working on corporate development. So big partnerships. Um, it was an insurance technology solution. So buying online insurance for small businesses. Um, I decided that I didn't, wasn't particularly keen on insurance. It wasn't a super fascinating field. Um, credit cards was more fun, but ultimately where I landed after all of that was at a company called 3Z Brands. And that's where I am now. And I really enjoy that. We are a portfolio of mattress companies, mattress brands, and we sell direct to consumer. We sell business to business, wholesale, and it's really fascinating. And it has introduced me to the world of consumer insights, um, building upon a lot of the analytics that I did previously in my career. Also adding on top of that, a lot of market research, strategic planning kind of thing. So it, it did a really, has done a really good job of combining all of the things that I worked on previously, both from a technical perspective, like a lot of things that I learned at Bentley and throughout my career, and then from a more functional business perspective, in terms of the business process, things that aren't as data-driven. Um, and so that's where we landed. And in doing that, it has introduced me in the last couple of years to this whole world of consumer insights. And I find consumer insights super fascinating. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that looks like and how can we think about it in the realm of marketing. And so that's a little bit about me. 
Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me later on. But you know, consumer insights and using data to drive decision making. So, as you will see when sooner or later you hopefully start your career, is that every organization makes a claim that they are a data driven organization. Most of the time, that's true, particularly because there are so many sources of data, different touch points for customers, particularly in the retail realm. If you're shopping, you get an Instagram ad and you're shopping directly from Instagram or from Twitter or from TikTok, you can only imagine the amount of data that a retailer is capturing um, to help drive that purchase. And then also after you make that purchase, how they keep you engaged, um, how they get you to come back and buy more, how they get you to love that brand. And so it's really exposes, you're, you're exposing a lot of your information, which is true for pretty much any purchase. But from a retailer's perspective, there are a lot of tools that we can use to kind of help drive that purchase. And so what I wanted to talk about and introduce, because thinking back to my own courses at Bentley and, you know, I, you will have taken the same courses that I did for the most part. Um, maybe if you do information systems, you'll take exactly the same courses, but I wanted to introduce something that I think is pretty interesting that I never got introduced um, to myself. So what we're looking at here is basically a customer journey map and we're shopping for a car. And I bring this up because a car is a big ticket item, but also a mattress. And so, as I alluded to, at 3 z Brands, we have a portfolio of brands and we sell mattresses and mattresses are pretty expensive. And also you spend a lot of time sleeping in your mattress. And so what I wanted to get across is the shopping journey for someone who's buying a car or buying a mattress, you know, this instance, it's a car, but it'll basically replace it. And so we'll just imagine as we bring this up, I'll talk to you about why I did it on the next slide. But basically you want to think about consumer insights in the realm of not just getting up someone to buy or what happens after they buy, but you want to really put yourselves in the shoes of the customer from both a purchasing journey perspective and from the perspective of like how they shop online, you really have to look, feel, and play the part of the customer in order to kind of optimize the conversion, which is purchasing. So imagine we have Eric here and he is, as they call an emotional car buyer. So he wants to buy his car based on aesthetics and status. He's just moved to a new area and he's shopping for a new car that's fun to drive, independable for everyday commuting. Okay, so Eric is this persona, right? And Eric's brother might be <clears throat> another persona. Eric's brother might be really exclusively interested in a hybrid car that has offerings for plugging in at every three miles, whatever it is. And his aunt might be um, somebody that wants a sports car with that's a convertible. And so as you think about that, I bring these up because every single shopper is different. Um, generally, you know, in the world of mattresses, at least, um, there's always something that would make someone buy an item that is very similar, but just different enough. And here, here's how I explain. In our portfolio of brands, we have eight brands, right? And some of them overlap pretty pretty similarly. Uh, for example, we have one brand in our portfolio called Lisa and another one that's called Birch. If you were to look at it on paper, you might think these are super similar. Why would anyone choose brand A versus brand B? But the difference and the nuance comes between comes in the aspect of their persona. And that's what you kind of try to unravel the difference between Eric and his cousin. And that's where you can kind of direct them to the right brand. And so I bring this up in terms of the phases also. So now we know a little bit about Eric's persona and that's work that is done in Consumer Insights to understand people who have bought from your brand, what are they like? You know, how much TV do they watch? Um, what, what kind of media do they use? How much do they donate to charity? You can really get super deep and you can capture that information in a variety of ways, which I'll touch on in the next slide, but you wanna understand Eric as a person, right? And that becomes super valuable, not just in the world of mattresses, but in the world of, for example, Johnson & Johnson has a portfolio of brands, some of them for shaving. They want to understand people who buy a certain razor brand A versus brand B. What is the difference? Why would someone choose 
that product over another product. And so understanding those nuances is how you can target, is how you can create better messaging, is how you can get them to buy more. Um, in the market, it's super competitive, particularly mattress space, tons of online retailers of mattresses. Some might argue there's not that much difference. Um, and so making use of that delta, that change is, is critical. And so here we have Eric, he sees a TV commercial, you know, in the context of one of our biggest brands, Helix. Imagine he's listening to a podcast by Joe Rogan and they say, hey, this podcast is sponsored by Helix. Um, Helix offers great mattresses. If you're looking for one, use the discount code um, Joe Rogan 20 on helixsleep.com and you'll get 20% off your purchase. And so now Eric is thinking, hmm, you know, I guess I could use a new mattress. Maybe that's a, that's a good idea. Or he could have been listening to the podcast already knowing that he needed a new mattress. Either way, he's now considering buying a new mattress. Whether he was considering it before or considering it after, it's kind of impossible to know. But now we know he's considering a new mattress. And he goes, okay, um, cool. So let me, let me go on helixsleep.com and let me check out the mattresses. And maybe he does that and then he kind of goes off the website and then a week later he gets a Facebook ad, right? You've been in this position. I've been in this position. You go on Instagram, you get an advertisement, you come back, you leave, you iterate the process and you're like, dang, they got me. But what happens in between is kind of this long process. So he comes back to the website and he says, all right, look, I have all these mattresses. Now I'm going to explore the options. And this is this and the comparison time period is, is a big period, right? And so you go on the website, you shop for different options. You see which mattress has the layers that you like, which one has cooling, you know, you explore. And then after you do that, you say, wait, there's a lot of other mattresses on the market. So let me compare to other mattresses. Cool. Let me go to Purple. Purple is a huge competitor of ours. And now they go online and they say best mattress for side sleepers. And they end up on a page, right? And a page that says, these are the best 10 mattresses for side sleepers. And then the consumer clicks, they read through different portfolios of mattresses. They say, ah, oh, this one has this, but it's priced at this. Doesn't really matter. They're gonna go through a very robust comparison feature. In the context of buying a car, Eric might go to the dealership, he might test drive the car. The thing that comes becomes very difficult is you can't really test a mattress in earnest, right? You can go to the store, you can test a mattress, but now he's basically spent two to three months exploring, comparing, testing, okay? And then he says, you know what? I've picked a mattress. I'm gonna buy this mattress. It gets shipped to his house. He tries it. Um, maybe he goes to a retail store before he does that. And maybe he doesn't even like it. And then he returns it. And then he kind of starts that whole process over again. The whole reason I kind of bring this up is because I just wanna clarify that it is super important to keep all of these unique steps in mind as you build out, as the brands kind of operationalize and try to optimize everything that happens on site. When each of these pillars has a different channel that you optimize for. So just talking about the comparison page, like the comparison journey, that's a huge journey for a shopper. You wanna make sure that every, all the information is situated on the site in a manner that's clear, in a manner that's like very articulate and that keeps them on the site. And so, again, I kind of come back to this, all the saying, particularly for big ticket items, like a mattress, like a car, like a sofa, and things that, you know, you might not turn around, turn over super quickly. The average lifespan of a car or of a mattress is five to eight years, right? And so you need to get that sale and, and do it properly because you won't have a chance. It's not like buying direct-to-consumer towels, right? You as a shopper, if you buy a set of Instagram towels or some random item in six months, you're going to have an option to buy another one. And so in this instance, you don't. So you really need to put your thinking cap on, your feeling cap on, and understand how the consumer is thinking. Um, and so this is a psychological process. You know, as a consumer, you're going through the process, you might not realize it, but I spend my days talking to shoppers, talking to customers, and you see that it's a super emotional process, particularly because health is involved, sleep, but also because it's expensive. And so you want to be very empathetic to that fact. And as I alluded to previously, each of these phases means different forms of data and different forms of insights to capture those. And so 
this is what you will, you know, you might not see this in academia. I didn't see it much in academia, but it's a huge concept in day-to-day, -day, in corporate, if you will, um, as you think about optimizing for the consumer's journey. Okay, so we kind of have that broken down. And so how do we think about consumer insights in general? So we know now that buying a big ticket item is a psychological process, an emotional process, but there's a lot of other things that happen in order to optimize it. So what I like to say is that consumer insights refers to basically having a very deep understanding of your customers, customers across all the brands, right? Because there might be a company like us that has a portfolio of brands, understanding their behaviors, their preferences, and even their needs. And then with all that data, whether it's browsing history, purchase patterns, if they return the product, how they respond to certain campaigns on our site, if we build predictive models with that data, we can communicate with them in a way that's wicked personalized and consistently provides them with value, right? That leads, hopefully, to some strong loyalty and good relationships. And so all of that to say is that we use all the information we can to get them to like us to get them to like us, to get them to buy from us, and to create some brand loyalty that leads to referrals, that leads to people speaking highly of us in conversation, that leads to influencers um, wanting to use and refer our products. And so that becomes super important as you try to expose your brand to different avenues of across, across the internet, you know? And so how do we do that, right? There's tons of ways. And so one of the big ways is market research data. So anytime you introduce a new product to the market, there is tons and tons of <laughs> market research to be done, right? In the world of, you can think about this, you know, I, I speak in the world of mattresses, but you can think about this in the world of, another thing that I'm really keen on is consumer wearables like Fitbits, Apple Watches. And so think that you want to launch a new, um, a new Fitbit, a competitor, you can't just do that, right? There is way too much going on in the world of consumer wearables to just launch it and not really understand if there is a need for that product, who is competing in that product, where is the, where is there a lot of like lacking, um, it, where, where are their products lacking? And most importantly, like if it's actually needed, right? So there's a lot to consider before you actually launch a product, before you make a adjustments to a product, you need to make sure there's a product market fit, like somebody actually wants it, um, if you can expand it, right? There's, so there's so much from a, just from a general market research and in your courses, you will, without a doubt, conduct competitive intelligence, market research across tons of different aspects. And that could be a competitive landscape, which companies compete with which other companies or which products are competing with which products and that intelligence is critical. Um, it is at the forefront of trying to understand the most we can about our products and about our consumers. And so we have that, right? And that leads the charge. We also have, you know, data about customers that have already bought. And so <laughs> there's so many, um, you know, one of the main sources of insight also is after you've bought. That is huge because in that one transaction, we can identify an almost endless amount. We have an endless amount of data that we can kind of model, um, drive insights from. And just to give you a super uh, kind of a basic example of what I mean by this. And so uh, if you were to just look at, recently I conducted an analysis pertaining to the gender distribution on some of our brands. And basically the way I did that was by analyzing the first names of like hundreds of thousands of consumer transactions across each of the brands and then forecasting them as either male or female. And what you can see is the distribution of male or female across each of the brands. And based on that data, we were able to make adjustments to the models that we use on each of the brands so that the consumer can resonate a bit more with the product that they're buying. And so we had one brand which had predominantly, for example, um, females. And we found out that the brand was predominantly 
targeted towards men. Or we had another brand, we also did this with age, where the models in the photo shoots were too young. We found out that the average customer was a bit older. And so we redid our photo shoots with models that are a bit older. And it's those small things, those small details that get customers to feel like they're being seen, like they're being heard, and that this is the brand for them. And you see this every day when you go on Instagram, when you go on Facebook, you get advertisements and you're like, oh, you know, I kind of vibe with this. I understand what's going on. This brand kind of gets me. And so purchase data, as I alluded to, is super critical. Other kinds of data um, so that you can optimize the journey for customers. Customer service data is really important. And, you know, that could just be like you're going on site, you're inquiring in the chat with a customer service representative. Hey, um, do you sell mattress size ABC? Maybe it's a weird size mattress. It's not like a queen or a king. And where can I find it? If you consistently get inquiries about the sizes of mattress, maybe the way you're presenting data about the size of the mattress is not optimized. Um, if you're getting questions about shipping times, then clearly something is, is not matching up in terms of how the consumer is at least perceiving that part of the journey. And so customer service data is also a huge component, as is return data. For example, you buy a mattress, you don't like it, you return it. That whole realm provides a massive amount of information. What other data do we have? Um, behavioral data is awesome. So there's so much behavioral data you know you can use to spot trends, opportunities, pain points. That could be anything pertaining to demographics, like I alluded to earlier. Um, I recently consulted, conducted a very large scale study pertaining to behavioral data on all of our brands. And now I even know for each of the nine brands, like how many minutes of TV each of these people watches, uh, how many minutes they sleep, what position they sleep in, um, if they donate to charity, how much they donate to charity. So we have an absolute wealth of information but this information doesn't just flow into you always. So like you can see purchase data. Yeah, that flows in. Customer service data, that flows in. But behavioral data and some aspects of that you need to get. And that's also a big component of the consumer insights realm. You need to go and acquire that data. It doesn't just flow into you in a nicely presented deck or into your database. Like you need to go and actively put your thinking cap on, your customer cap on, and go back and try to get that data to tell the story. And so we have that. And then we also have consumer sentiment data, um, satisfaction data. You know, we have tons of products. You know, we sell probably 250 different types of mattress and bedding products across nine brands. There's a lot of sentiment data and like satisfaction data that goes along with that. Um, and we can kind of track those changes over time if we make changes to the product itself. Maybe we remove a layer of foam to optimize the cost and we find out six months later that that was a bad move because customers are pissed. And so you need to track that kind of information in order to optimize the product, to optimize the financials of the business, and also to maximize the consumer sentiment and how they feel about the product. And so that is kind of the world and like the way that we think about it. And one thing I will caveat and always asterisk is that all of this is done in the in the world of marketing you know the objective here is not to just aimlessly understand what position your customers sleep in or how much money they donate to charity it's that's useless without the context of building a story for those customers that they resonate with and so that's what you want to do with the information and you want to optimize that journey on site you want to optimize your products you want to optimize the words you use, the images you use, the marketing campaigns you run, the promotions you give, all of that insight, um, all of this insight is used to optimize those. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So last slide here. Um, so basically, as I alluded to, how do we use this information in the context of marketing? And so what happens is that most retailers have a portfolio of brands operating under one hidden parent company. And so I found this, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. When I started working in this field, I found that super fascinating because you'll see companies, for example, like Johnson & Johnson, 
who obviously many people are familiar with, have a massive portfolio of micro brands. Just to give you an idea, Johnson & Johnson makes Certec, they make Aveeno, they make Tylenol, they make Band-Aid, they make a million other things that most customers are not aware of. And that's intentional, right? Brands and parent companies want to capture as much share of mind from the customer shopping for pain relievers, shopping for skincare products. They want to capture as much share of mind without the consumer really knowing it. You know, we operate, for example, 3C Brands under the parent company name 3C Brands. The only people who know that name are people that work in the mattress industry. Everybody else that shops knows us as Helix, knows us as Brooklyn Bedding, knows us as Birch, and customers do not know that we are one entity. And that's important because then in the brain of the shopper, they're considering both a Helix, a Brooklyn, a Birch, and a Purple Mattress, but they don't know that 75% of their consideration is under one parent company. And that gives us the opportunity to capture share of mind in the customer's mind. And so keeping in mind that each of the brand's customers, as we've spoken about a lot, has different wants, has different needs, has different desires. And so in the context of even Mars, Mars makes snacks and candy. What is the difference between somebody who wants a Snickers bar and somebody who wants an m and That is the job of a consumer researcher it's their job to identify what those differences are, how they can optimize for those differences, what they can do with the packaging, what they can do with the pricing. And so understanding those wants, understanding those needs, you know, putting their, themselves in the, in the mind of the consumer, they can make those kinds of adjustments to pricing, to packaging, to distribution channels. But without that context, it becomes very difficult. It becomes kind of like a guessing game. And so, as I said, it helps us that really, I hope that kind of like hammers in the point of how critical it becomes to understand the shopper's need. You like, you just imagine a situation where you are talking to your friend and you say, oh my gosh, I wish I had uh, a product that stopped my Fitbit from getting scratched while I'm working out. And then the next thing you see 10 minutes later is you have an advertisement for a product that's stopping your Fitbit from getting scratched. So obviously there's some weird stuff happening there and I don't even know what's happening. But the idea is that they there is a product market fit. Someone created that product. They're optimizing for it. And they know that there's a customer who desires that. And so, you know, as we think about no matter what product you're selling, in the context of mattresses, it's no different. Brands are targeting different things, whether it's a mattress for athletes, mattress for natural mattresses, side sleepers. All of that needs to be done to meet the customers where they want to be met using data, using research, whether it's distributed surveys offsite, whether it's um, like immediately post-purchase, there's so many channels to capture all of that information. Um, and we use it to develop products. We use it to adjust imagery on site. We use it to partner with influencers on Facebook, Instagram, things of that nature. And that's kind of the way that it gets done. You know, it's difficult to speak to all brands, but one thing I do know is that it's so fascinating how every single product that you have in your home <laughs> is targeted to you in a way that you might not realize. Some of them, um, you know, I look at, you know, if, if you open your medicine cabinet, there's so many various products. So if you look at a something that holds your supplements, for example. You might have bought it at CVS and your friend might have a luxury supplement holder that's made out of metal and that meets their needs in a different way than yours. You might have been a price sensitive shopper and so you bought something super cheap on Amazon. They might have gone an ad on Instagram for a luxury metal version that holds all these products. And so just think about the needs that are being met in those two worlds. Maybe he's a traveler, he takes a lot of supplements and you're just like a simpler person that needs something to hold a couple of pills of vitamin C to prevent you from getting sick in the doors. And so all of these things I find super fascinating, particularly in the realm of companies that have portfolios of brands. And so for the most part, that's it. Um, I, I really wanted to introduce you to the world of brand research, 
consumer insights and how data kind of makes that story come to life. Because I found that in my curriculum, um, it's not really super exposed. It's more of a specialized field. Um, and I think it's a super fascinating field. And hopefully you learn something about it. But so for the most part, for the presentation, uh, that's what I got. But I'm really, really happy to spend some time doing a Q&A uh, about any of the content that's here. Um, so yeah, that's what I got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I, I actually have a question. And uh, folks, if you want to post a question into the chat or just uh, you know raise your hand, by all means, go right ahead and do so. Um, you talked about how you you had to go and search out the behavioral and um, data, you know, where, and, and so my curious is like, where did you find that? And did you have to pay for it? And was that really expensive? And like, just tell yeah. me more a little about where you got that data. And then if you don't yeah. mind a little bit of the technical stuff too, like then what happened, you got it. And then what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was going to, I was going to put in a slide about how it gets captured because there's so many different channels. But for example, for the behavioral data, one of the methods that I love so dearly is our surveys, distributed surveys. And so when you think about surveys, um, a lot of us have the same thought in mind and it's pretty accurate. It's maybe you bought a product from a retailer and then a month later, they're like, hey, take this brief survey and maybe you'll win a hundred bucks. We've all gotten those, that's me, right? So I'm, I'm that person sending those emails and saying, take this survey. And so what we did for the behavioral data I call it um, a psychographic study, was capture about 3,000 customers from eight of our brands. So we have a portfolio of eight or nine brands and ask an absolute mind-boggling amount of information. And you would be very surprised, Mark, what people choose to answer when there is an opportunity to be compensated. And so in this instance, um, it was something like 40 questions, which is pretty big for a distributed survey and an opportunity to win $500 not even a guarantee to win $500 because in previous studies, I had done an analysis that basically paid one group $5 a response and did a control against another group where they entered to win $100 and the response rates were the same. Mm -hmm. And so after testing that, I said, why should I pay if people are doing the surveys anyway? Mm -hmm. And so after that, it kind of changed the game and reduced the cost by like 90%. So basically people were filling out the data and it really was questions about everything, about what position they sleep in, about if they vote left, right, or center, um, what kind of geography they live in. It was everything. And with that, basically, we'll be able to create a model that clusters our brands together. And also, you know, that clusters our brands together and finds similarities so that we can use that information for cross sells. So for example, we have one brand called Lisa, one brand called Birch. They are super similar in their behavior based on the responses that the customers had stated. And now we know that the persona of those customers is pretty similar. Qualitatively, the brand executives know that already, but now we know that we can use, we could, for example, if somebody is shopping for a product and it's $3,000 and you know, they abandon their cart and they say, meh, maybe not. We can send them an email from that sister brand now and say, hey, we have another product. Maybe it's like a hundred bucks cheaper. Maybe you'd consider this product as well. And we can deduce that it's probably going to work better than if we did that with a brand that's for athletes, for example. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was a really interesting study because we were able to find what also what are the drivers that push someone to a certain brand is it price and promotional sensitivity is it um the eco-friendly messaging and so we were able to create clusters and personas um and you can actually build it out and one of the things i'm doing now is like using a gpt to pretend that you're talking to the customer based on that data and so like, hey, you know, I'm Mark, I'm a Helix Sleep customer based on all this data, um, let's have a conversation. And you can kind of train the model to have a conversation with me and you can kind of test qualitatively like some of the things that I might say if you were to ask. And so there are different avenues to go with, but that was one really fascinating one. And so it wasn't super expensive, but when you start asking questions about 
political behavior and donations to charity, you'll get some angry emails. But generally speaking, we didn't get too many. <laughs> and and the, the, actually, that would, it relates to a question that just came in. Uh, um, it said, that, uh, the question is, are there any government imposed limitations on the methods in which customer data is collected? I mean, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, there are government imposed regulations. This, the thing about um, this method, surveys and on-site shopping experience, there are government restrictions, <laughs> but you'd be surprised how lenient they are, I will say. Um, you know, for surveys and stuff, they opt into them. So we can't force them to take, they opt in as a commercial transaction where they might win or earn some money. Um, when you're shopping online, and you transact an absolute boatload of data gets sent to the back end and through different softwares that track everything. And they're mostly done through cookies. Um, so we know if you are shopping on an iPhone 14, 14 Pro, on Safari, on Chrome, how much time you spent. But yes, there's always restrictions. There's particularly restrictions around email addresses and how we use those email addresses. Um, you know, you've probably unsubscribed so many times from an email and gone emails for another 10, 14 days. That's intentional because the government mandate is something like that, like 10, 14, 20 days. Uh, but when you subscribe, you start getting them right away. It's not a coincidence, right? We want you on our email list as long as humanly possible, because in that 14 days, you might convert and make another purchase or you might report us to spam. But there's like, <laughs> that's another um that's a that's a huge that's a huge one also. So, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty fascinating. But in the capitalist society that isn't super data um, restrictive, you know, if you go to Europe, the GDPR is a lot more restrictive in terms of what they do with customer data um, than than in the U.S. So, if you were ever to go to study in Europe or go on a trip to Europe and you subscribe to a newsletter you might get an email saying, are you sure you want to subscribe to that newsletter? Whereas if you're in the States, it'll be like, heck yeah, subscribe to the newsletter. And so you need a confirmation. Um, it's a lot more restrictive, but in the US, it's not crazy restrictive. Awesome, thanks. Are there any other questions that are out there? Oh, looks like we have a couple more. Uh, let's see here. Well, uh, so the next one is just, what are some of the challenges encountered in your job? Yeah. Lots. Um, I would say one of the primary things is making use and actioning all the data and the insights that come that come through. And so one of the ways that I spend most of my time is trying to seek a balance between analyzing data, whether it's conducting surveys, analyzing sales order data, looking at return data, all the data that we spoke about, um, analyzing that data, putting it into beautiful, meaningful slides um, and presenting it to executives. So that's what I spend most of my time to, doing. But also that one of the biggest challenges is getting them to make something of it. So you can tell them, for example, and this is a challenge that you that most people will encounter with data and presenting it to executive teams. You might tell them that most of their brand is female and they thought it was male right? Just a basic example. What you really want them to do is to contact the team out on the West Coast that we have, schedule a photo shoot um, with new models, recruit the new models, you update that imagery, post it on site. They're not going to do that, right? So you need to kind of execute. You can do the strategy, you can do that analysis, you can present, um, but you also need to see that change through. And that is the perpetual challenge particularly when the team is small, the resources are limited, or you have nine brands with like seven different brand executives. And so pushing that change through is where the impact comes in, but also it's the hardest part, yeah. right? And so you need to balance, like I, one of the things I consistently find challenging is balancing the researcher and operator cap. And so like I am a researcher, but also research is not useless. It's just nice to have without like the action component of it. And so that's what kind of pushes you to the next level. Um, that's what's been on my to-do list and what I've been trying to balance for the last year, for, for, frankly, for my entire career. Um, because as you move up in your career, you never really stop 
doing <laughs> analyses, but the what what about it, you know, like so what is becomes way more critical, way more critical. And you know, resources get constrained and things like that. And so that's one massive challenge. Another big challenge is also <laughs> like keeping a repository and just distributing the information across the organization consistently, particularly since I've been in the role for two years. And like I said, we have lots of brands, lots of mechanisms for collecting insights and lots of insights in general. Distributing and keeping a repository and keeping people up to date is super difficult. Um, no matter how well stored the data is, no matter what titles you use for your presentations, someone will always ask a question because there's a lot out there. So that's another huge challenge. But I would think that the first component about like executing on that change is without a doubt one of the biggest challenges. I've got a couple more questions that popped in. Um, what made you switch from finance background to the marketing research and analysis field? Yeah. So... With information systems, um, you know, I had a finance minor, I would say, and I was, I kind of did that just for my own education. Um, I found it super, super helpful. I think from my first couple of years, first four or five years in consulting, you really see a lot of things in consulting. Um, you work with executives quite a bit and also combining that with my love for data and analytics, but not in the sense of like programming, just in the sense of making complex data digestible, particularly for higher up audiences. Like I've, I've, I was doing that basically since the first day of my career. Um, how people trusted me at different companies with that kind of data, I have no idea, but it ended up working out pretty well. Um, but making information digestible was what I really fell in love with and using the things that I learned at Bentley. I'm not a salesman. You guys are already in school. Like I learned a lot of really good things in my classes um, that I was able to very directly leverage in my day-to-day, -day, basically starting from my internship in my third year, even my second year. Like what I learned in my courses was very applicable. And so I knew that I liked what I liked because I started doing that very early on. But then after I left consulting, um, this role I've gotten that question before, but this role really is quite similar in the sense that you're answering questions that people don't have answers to, and you're doing it for executives, and you're doing it for, with a lot of data. Yeah. And so this instance, it's a bit different because there's also a psychological component to it. And there's also a, and that's kind of what's fascinating about it. And so I was able to combine my love for data and my love for answering questions and presenting complex data that I had previously, right? Like at, at Amex, at EY, and to kind of bring it here, but just in the sense of mattresses. And so you, I'm sure as you go along throughout your career, you'll realize that there's a lot of things that overlap, a lot of skills that you can bring along from one place to another. And in fact, like uh, if I were to think back to the job description of this job before I started, it said, we want five to seven years of consulting experience. And there's a reason for that. It's because they're super interchangeable. Um, the skill set that you would find, they're super interchangeable and you learn a lot in consulting that kind of helps you drive change for at the executive level, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I ended up here. I'm very happy I did because consulting is generally very broad and hard to answer. It's like very generalist. And so now at least I feel personally that I have like some sort of specialty. Um, and so that's that's kind of the good thing about it. Uh, the next question is, what major would you recommend for people interested in technology and, and finance these days? Is it still CIS or or do you think that with the rise in AI that it should be more of a, a big data and data analytic focus? Yeah, well, I should check the Bentley curriculum. I mean, so okay. I, <laughs> I, I'm not, um, what I would say is I checked the Bentley curriculum last year and I was still happy like with what Bentley was offering um, for information systems. I loved information systems because number one, my father was an engineer, but also because he said something to me that resonated. He said, I told him I wanted to study finance. He said, finance hasn't changed in 200 years. I said, well, in a sense, you're kind of right, right? Like it, it's evolved in the mechanisms 
that you can trade and the financial markets a little bit, but like the core fundamentals of finance hasn't necessarily changed so deeply. And so he told me like by studying information systems, you'll be able to find that intersection. And little did I know is my father trying to convince me to study a certain thing because in part he was subsidizing my education, which was <laughs> fair, but I agree with him. And so I was able to understand basically um, everything about technology and the way it intersects with business. Um, and you'll hear people say that all the time. You're like, what does that mean? You don't really get it until you start working. Like now, more than when I started six, seven years ago, the intersection between business and technology has been like an exponential thing. And I started my career at a time when it was like just at the peak of that. What I would say is that all of the courses at Bentley do a really good job of integrating that, in my opinion, at least when I studied, and that was seven, eight years ago. Um, I think information systems for me did a really nice job because I was able to understand the technical component. And there has never, almost never a day in my career where somebody has said something to me um, that has been too technical for me to not understand it. And that's because the foundations that I got enabled me to like put my thinking cap on and use that information to understand. You know, I might not know yeah. how to write the same programming language, but I understand the object orientation or like what they're referring to pretty easily. And so it gave me personally the, the foundation to work at that intersection. And so I just find technology ever so fascinating um, in the world of information systems, particularly because with the foundation, you can kind of go in any direction. That's my that's my own personal opinion. I, I, so I, I'll I'll use the opportunity to share my opinion here. Um, I just is it still CIS and programming, or is it the AI and and big data? I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not an or; it's an and, especially at the undergraduate level. I think to be most effective, as Mark talked about, um, just having a good, solid, broad understanding of all the technologies and what they're capable of, um, you'll make a bigger stint by being able to um, take that broad understanding and then apply it to whatever part of the business that, that you're looking at. That would be the way I would answer that. But um, yeah, I, agree. I, I would, I would also say Mark, like <clears throat> one thing that I would know is that currently, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm hiring for a part-time data science intern, master student. Um, and I need them to have like a pretty specific set of skills. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really struggled with and I, I still, I'm making an offer out in the next couple of days and something that I still struggle with is finding someone who has, who can put like a marketing, their thinking cap on from like a marketing perspective mm -hmm. and build out predictive models. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's super rare and they get paid, they're getting paid like very well. And for me, they're still lacking like a little bit of that component. So if you're able to do both, like there is endless value. Yep. They're master students, and so they're more specialized. It makes sense. But I just reiterate what you said. Basically, having that understanding and then specializing and then combining is like ever so powerful. Yeah, 100% agree. All right, one last question here uh, that's come in, and then uh, we'll wrap this. Just say, how could someone apply uh, this thinking to a small business with just one brand? It's a really good question. Um, I think the there are going to be certain components of capturing that information that will be inherently more difficult with a small business of one brand. But one of the most effective things would probably be having focus groups with your customers and also looking at historical transaction data. And so depending on what the brand is, um, in this example, maybe we can say this is a brand like a construction company, right? You your uncle owns a construction company, it's one brand, and he has 150 clients a year, one of the best things to do would be to talk to them directly. And that could be like a focus group where you could get a lot of the customers in the same room and talk about something or look at the historical purchase data. How much do they spend? What kind of services are they buying? Things of that nature. Um, but the thinking and the overarching perspective remains the same despite the size of the company. It's just the mechanisms that change a little bit. You might not have data about what item or what um, phone they use while shopping, 
but you'll still be able to like put that emotional, the empathetic cap on being like, what did they need while they were shopping? So if there's a small brand, small business, you can still ask that question, like ask yourself, what do they need? What needs am I trying to meet? Where can I meet them in between um, and try to find that perspective? But you will find that most of the times this field is like, this is a function that often lacks for it's, it's often lacking in smaller enterprises um, or single brand organizations, but it doesn't mean that it, it shouldn't be there. It's just that it's not a place that's super heavily invested in, but I think once it starts getting invested in that the organizations tend to reap a lot of benefits. So really good question.